from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of PagerDuty Summit 2020. Brought to you by PagerDuty. Welcome to the Cube's coverage of PagerDuty Summit 20. I'm Lisa Martin, and I'm pleased to welcome back one of the PagerDuty alumni of the Cube, Rachel Obster, the VP of Product for PagerDuty. Rachel, it's great to talk to you today. Oh, it's great to talk to you too, Lisa. Thank you for having me. So, one benefit of this, you know, massive pivot in the last six months is is companies like PagerDuty get to reach even more folks than would come in person. So I know the summit is expecting a lot more people to attend because there's no travel limits. But since this massive pivot happened in the last few months, I wanted to understand what some of the things are that you've observed as the VP of product. What have you seen that really is revolutionary? You know, one thing that we saw, and this is back a couple months um, when COVID first happened, we thought, you know, it seems like there's an unprecedented shift to people using online services. And so we wanted to check and see if that load was represented in our platform. And of course, you know, we help companies manage digital operations, respond to incidents. And so we actually looked at um, the incident load and we saw that some industries or some verticals had seen an unprecedented um, growth in incidents. So this load was really. Um, impacting their platforms. And in some cases, like with online learning or e-learning, we saw they had over 10 times the number of incidents in the period immediately following the start of the pandemic and everyone shifting to work from home from what they had seen just before it. So was this some of the things that you looked at at your platform? And then was that what prompted the survey that you guys just released last week? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we saw that in our platform. We've also seen since then it has calmed down a bit. So if we look at the six months after um, the pandemic really started and everyone moved to work from home versus the six months before, we saw about a 38% increase. So it's still an increase um, even now. And so then this did prompt us to do a, um, a survey because we wanted to see not just what was reflected in our platform, but we wanted to talk to maybe companies that may not be PagerDuty customers as well as customers and also understand how their attitudes you know, were, were changing and what they were seeing. So it's, it's not just about the data, but it's also about the beliefs and what sort of stress people are feeling. And that stress is so real and it's something that if, if it's not addressed, you know, we're talking about customer support folks who are on the digital front lines and can affect a customer churning, for example, the brand reputation is on the line. So what are some of the interesting things that you found talking to these IT practitioners, these DevOps folks about what they've experienced in terms of incidents and their time the last six months? Yeah, that is a great question. So I'll, I'll share some of the data that we found. I mean, one is that responders said that pressure on their digital services has increased about 80%. So that's, that's a pretty significant number. 62% um, of IT and DevOps practitioners are working an additional or spending an additional 10 hours per week on responding to incidents. And so if you think about, you know, the average work week, maybe it's 40 hours. I know most of us don't actually work 40 hours. Maybe they're working 50 hours. Even in that case, like that's a fifth of their time. So this is pretty significant um, amount of their time that they're spending on responding to issues as opposed to innovating, which is really what they want to be doing is building new goods and services and, and you know, capabilities for their customers. So spending some, you know, 10 hours extra a week reacting and i imagine that a good amount of those 10 hours are in the middle of the night or or kind of random hours whereas before the volume they didn't see so what are some of the things that pager duty is can do to help with that like what are some of the things that these practitioners talk to you guys about this will help us tremendously because we know that this crazy time is going to be tbd for a little while longer yeah, that's a really good question. And just some stats on that, because we also have stats on that from the survey. We saw that um, more than half of the respondents of the survey are being asked to respond to incidents um, five plus times, more than five times on personal time during the week. And so that could be, um, it doesn't have to be in the middle of the night. It could be in the middle of the night, it could be after hours, dinner time, breakfast time. 
but that's still a lot of interruptions for you know your your life. And so there are a number of things that PagerDuty can do. Um, one of the, a couple of the things that we really focus on are around intelligence and automation. And so examples of intelligence are if you have a lot of issues that are coming at you, you may not know which ones are important, which ones you should work on, which ones you can ignore, which ones are part of a larger problem. And so we have a lot of capabilities in the system that group things together, help you understand which ones are critical, which ones are not critical, get them to the right person, and also provide important context for fixing them. So you may want to know things like, um, this is impacting my service right now. Are other services impacted? Which teams are working on that? Who should I collaborate with? Or you may want to know, hey, I've never seen this before myself. Has it ever happened before? I'd like to see past incidents that are similar. So those are just some examples of the things that we can provide. It's intelligence when someone is you know, interrupted and has to immediately figure out, what do I do with this issue? Um, when it comes to automation, you know, we can help customers in a number of different ways. One is we can automate menial tasks. Like, let's imagine that that you find out there's an issue, you think this is a very serious issue, you need to pull in more people. Well, pulling them into the, a bridge, a, ta a chat channel, um, making sure they have the right information, we make it super easy for customers to do things like that. But we also make it easy for them to automate maybe diagnostics, like maybe they want to um, call out to a system and pull in more information. Maybe they wanna actually restart a server. So there's all sorts of ways that you can automate. We also help you automate communication to the broader um, um, environment or the broader set of people. So you mentioned earlier customer service teams. Well, if you're a development team and you know there's an issue and you know that customer service teams are soon going to be getting a whole bunch of tickets, um, they need to know what's going on so they can answer those tickets and maybe get ahead of them, maybe even post something on a status page telling customers, yes, we know we have an issue so that they know it's being worked on and, and they know that it's being taken care of. You know, one of the things I didn't think about when in the beginning of this pandemic, because there was such chaos, there still is chaos, is this, the demand for digital services dramatically increased. And it wasn't just ordering mm -hmm. groceries online or, okay, I can't go to a store, so I'm gonna depend even more on, on Amazon than I have before. And we have this culture where we expect we can get anything we want in some cities overnight or rather in a couple of hours. The demand is there, the customer expectation is there, and the patience is dwindling. If, think of like a Netflix, which is a customer of, of PagerDuty's and all of the competing streaming services. Uh, if I'm not going to get what I want within a second, I'm going to go find somebody else who's going to be able to deliver the service that I'm expecting. So the demand on the digital services is greater and greater. And one of the things I saw in that survey that you guys just published is that 40% uh, of the respondents think it's actually going to get worse from here. So they've got to be able to implement AI, uh, AI ops tools and automation now if the volume isn't going to decrease, right? Yeah, you've really nailed it, Lisa. That's exactly what's happening out there. And I think um, it's not going to decrease. We've basically, not just had a, a blip in time, people have shifted how they're operating to being online and now they're used to it. And this is probably not gonna change in the foreseeable future. And so absolutely, when you're seeing these types of increases in demand for your services, which leads to more incidents, it leads to more noise, um, it leads to a lot more operational work. Basically, you have to find a way to manage it if you wanna keep innovating. And to your point, um, customers or end users expect more innovation, right? They're not going to expect that uh, a company is going to stop innovating just because they have got a lot of more users now. So, um, so absolutely, the the main way or one of the big ways that customers really need to address this is to be able to work smarter and you know tools that help you um, automate things and help you gather data faster and provide intelligence to things and help you find the signal from the noise like page duty are really important to serving that bigger need that is not going away as you said yeah that's the cubes tagline extracting signal from the noise and the thing that's important about that is right now as you talked about there's there's blurred lines right we either 
work from home or we live at work. And I think it, every day it can change. And that's challenging. Not only is there no commute, so you can work more, the expectation is you're gonna be online, you're gonna be accessible. But also one of the very real challenges that we're all experiencing, no matter what industry you work in, is burnout is real. It's been real for a long time, but right now it's mm -hmm. critical for organizations to help reduce, address it and help reduce it. What are some of the things that you're hearing when you're talking to customers about, hey guys, PagerDuty, how can you help my, my practitioners, my DevOps folks become less reactive? How can you help us manage these incidents so that they can go back to innovating, which is what they like to do because we wanna be able to you know, have productive, happy employees? Yeah, that's a great question. So some of the things that we can do is help you look across all your incidents and understand where are you getting repeat incidents. Um, we can also help you look at things that are showing up as incidents that are notifying people but aren't real incidents. So for instance, we've looked at our system and we've seen that um, a, a decent percentage of incidents ought to resolve within two minutes or three minutes. And so those are incidents that are still notifying someone but then maybe there's auto resolution capabilities in the platform. Maybe there's um, maybe it was just a, a very delicate monitor that was was finding something wasn't really there. Um, but in, in any case, this is disturbing someone. It may be waking them up for no reason. And so there are tools that we can provide that allow you to set rules around things like this. Like don't tell me about this unless it's still going for three minutes. Um, don't tell me unless it happens three times in a row. Like there's really easy ways to cut down on a lot of noise um, that distracts people, that interrupts them, that maybe bothers them off hours, which you really want to avoid. And then beyond that, there's also things that you can do in our system um, and in general that um, help you just understand when someone had a bad on call. So knowing when um, there are certain people that are, um, getting woken up a lot or, or responding off hours or spending a lot of time responding to issues or responding to just a lot of issues in general. Um, that's something that we can provide so that, you know, any manager can look across their team and just see like which people really need a little bit of relief. And I'm sure that would be welcomed by everybody in every industry. You know, we talk about customer experience all the time pandemic or no pandemic, but really ultimately something that I've always believed and seen it is that if the employee experience isn't really good, then that is directly uh, able to negatively impact the customer experience. But one of the things I was looking at too, like with respect to like first gen AI ops tools, with respect to ROI, companies think I'm not really getting that yet. So give me an insight into how PagerDuty thinks that second gen AI ops tools are going to help dial up that ROI for companies to really invest in this so that they are the winners of tomorrow? Yeah, that's a really good question. So a lot of the earlier AI ops tools require a lot of um, training. So, you know, people to spend time telling the system this should be grouped or that should be grouped. Um, and and also requires not just that upfront training for them to work, but also ongoing training. So continually training the system. And so second gen AI really uses the data in the system to automatically make suggestions about things. And that's um, very straightforward with a tool like PagerDuty because we have all this information about what happened in the past, what happened when you're responding to incidents, who responded to them, um, how long they took, how bad they were, and so we can really leverage a lot of that data to help automatically um, reduce noise and, and point out the things that are important um, without having people needing to spend a lot of time with the system up front before anything actually works. And so in fact, like we can just have you turn it on, it works, um, and it continues to learn and get better. And that's critical because in this digital default, as I know you got Pager Duty is talking about, I spoke with Jennifer Tejada about that. There is no more luxury of time about a company determining, well, how should we go on our digital transformation? That time luxury is gone. Last question, Rachel, for you. Fifth PD Summit, first virtual, but the opportunity to engage and interact with a lot more customers since there are no 
travel limits. I'm just curious, some of the things that are that you're excited about at this year's event. You know, one of the things I'm excited about is I think we're able to give our attendees a lot more choice of what do they attend because it's virtual. So you don't have to have a room, you know, where you can have a certain number of, um, you know, sessions and only one session at a time. So I think there's going to be more choice for our customers. Um, we're also going to have a great lineup of speakers. So I think this also means that not only can we have more attendees show up because it's more convenient, but we can have more really great speakers and industry luminaries because they don't have to also travel to the site, but they can they can do things from where they are. So I think those are two of the really great things about you know the remote world that we live in. I, of course, am disappointed that I'm not going to be able to see more customers face to face or at least in the same room and, and have that interaction. But we'll still have plenty of meetings, even though we'll be doing it online. Silver linings. Well, Rachel, it's been great having you on the program. I can't wait to hear about all the great things that come from the Summit 20. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Lisa. It's great to be here. I'm Lisa Martin. You've been watching this CUBE conversation.